Greetings. Welcome. Welcome. So I, I picked up I picked up some of this um there it is. Some of this uh, zinc sheet. And I had some copper sheet lying around. So zinc copper. So I thought I gotta look at batteries. I knew it was gonna happen at some point. So if you bear with me, I'm gonna give you know like five, ten minutes just sort of a lay of the land background. And then I'll start to show you what I'm seeing. And I'm just starting to scratch the surface here. And uh, I, I didn't want to, you know, like try and do like a six hour video or something. But I can see there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff. Um, so why don't we just do the background and I'll show you a bit of what I'm seeing. And then uh, as things go along into the fall, ideally we'll just keep improving and testing this, this battery and see how far we can go with it. So it all starts with um, this man, Alessandro Volta, an Italian physicist and chemist working um, late 1700s, early 1800s. And um, you know, it's a little known fact about him, but he also he, uh, had a second career as a, as a stand-up comic at night. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was... That was bad, but man, they knew how to do serious back in the day, didn't they? Yeah, I don't want to argue with him. Sorry, Alessandro. So he gave us the, well, the, the term battery was coined by, um, by Ben Franklin, but um, Volta gave us the um, means of getting electricity from a chemical uh, reaction. And of course, he is also commemorated with the term volt. But he was in a gentlemanly argument with another Italian um, uh, physician and uh, physicist named Galvani, where you know you might you know know of, uh, for instance, like galva galvanic corrosion or galvanic um, isolation. So that goes back to Luigi Galvani. And what he had noticed was that when he touched a dissected frog leg with um, two dissimilar probes made of different materials, even though the frog was dead, the leg would twitch. And so Galvani was saying, well, maybe there's some sort of animal electricity that's an analog to the electricity that we're seeing with these experiments with Faraday and that this is another version of electricity. And at first, um, Volta was amenable to that idea. But when he looked at it some more, he found that he could reproduce a flow of electricity just with what he was terming a voltaic pile. Yeah, there's a picture that popped up. And so he had um, a plate of copper and a plate of zinc and then a, an electrolyte of seawater or salt water between the two. And he said, oh, you know, there's a current that flows here. And if you put them in series, which, you know, here you have your negative plate, your positive plate, and those are, uh, or rather positive negative, and those are um, connected together. And so you have a, a battery with higher voltage. I also, I hadn't realized, Volta improved and popularized the electrophorus. There it is. I'm going to have to um, show that at some point too. The perpetual electrophorus is what it was called. So in any event, if we go back to this picture of a, a battery, voltaic pile, this is not really the same as the lead acid battery. and you just have copper and zinc and electrolyte and electricity flows. And so why is that going on? And really the way we, we conceptualize it now is um, pretty much down to Linus Pauling. See how much more cheerful <laughs> they get in, uh, in the more modern uh, thing? But he won you know, two Nobel Prizes and anyone who's um, suffered through organic chemistry uh, knows all about Linus Pauling and so he has the idea of electron valence shells and to make a, a long story short not to get too far off but all of the elements are attempting to get a full 
outer valence shell. They want to be a noble gas. And so some of the elements then are, you know, happy to give up an electron or two if that leads to the previous shell being full and other elements are, are willing to barter and bargain if they can gain an electron or two and that leads to that shell being full and then they have a full valence shell. So here's a chart of the periodic table with the electronegativities jotted in and you can see it increases um, this way. So I guess, I don't know what that is, francium or something. And then this would be the most, uh, fluorine gas would be the most electronegative, and this the least electronegative. But here's copper and zinc, and there is an electronegativity difference. So this is the, the Pauling scale. You can't really see it real well, the values there. Um, so here's another one, and these values are, are not, you know, like a voltage difference or something. They, they're just, um, it's a different scale. So there's copper and there's zinc, and there's an electronegativity difference. So you have this electronegativity difference between copper and zinc, and so when those two are in an electrolyte solution, then um, electricity flows. Now, you would think, well, let's get more of an electronegativity difference, and so you know, as, as I'll show here in a little bit, you know, I did try it with aluminum and it was actually a bit worse. But we see like, here's lithium over there, so that would be, that'd be a good one. It's all the way down to 1.0 or um, magnesium is used in batteries. And you could think of ways to um, use other materials, but this was, this was good enough for Volta, who um, so generously gave us all of this. And so I figure it's good enough for me. So I just went in and started reproducing um, what he was doing and looking at it, and um, it's really just been fascinating for me. I'm not I'm not using salt water for reasons I'll go into, um, and you know again as I said the the electronegativity doesn't tell the whole story. So I did find this um, chemical education article, and. Let's see if I can find it. You know, unfortunately, the standard chemistry uh, description uh, doesn't explain where it's stored and at odds with this, that, and the other. And I tried my best to go through it. And basically, what I got out of it was that, you know, it's complicated. And so, electronegativity is driving the whole thing, but how effective the battery is is dependent on other variables as well. And as I said, um, this, this is the granddaddy of them all. So I wanted to start here, and you know I'm just kind of scratching the surface now, but I just find find it you know fascinating. So why don't I show you a little bit of what's going on with this, and maybe people will enjoy um, seeing that and coming along for the ride. Thanks. So let's go ahead and get started because there's about a couple dozen just I think cool experiments that, that could like, show just real quick. So here's a plate. Of zinc and here's a plate of copper and right now you know the, the meter is just kind of wandering around a little bit but if I press the meter to the um, the other plate there and nothing and that's that's exactly what you would expect now there was probably for you know maybe like a microsecond where they were exchanging electrons and ions to try to to get their electron valence shells where they wanted, but once they shuffled those, there was nothing more that could happen. They couldn't pull ions out of the air. So now, just real quick, we'll put in a dry piece of cardboard. So I just put a piece of cardboard there. we we'll put this back, do the same thing. And we're looking at a cool 0 0.019, 0 0.02 millivolts. So, getting there. All right, now let's um, take that piece of cardboard and we'll soak it just in tap water. So now I'm just soaking this, it's actually in once filtered water just to get a little bit of moisture on it. And now we'll do the same thing. Okay, so now we got the same thing, but now the cardboard is, is damp and I put the, the meter on it. There, 0.694 volts, 0.7. Not too shabby. Getting there. I just find that fascinating. 
that just because of the really the the different electron valence shells now you just have this current flowing however you see there is a 1k ohm resistor so we're going to now put a dummy load on this okay so now I've connected both ends of the meter across this thousand ohm resistor and we put the meter on and instead of 0 0.6 it's about 0 0.03 0 0.02 millivolts so because that's a thousand ohm resistor when you do the math that's um, 20 or 30 micro amps <laughs> that is putting out so we need to to think about though what's going on why what's what's the process that's happening so one of these plates is trying to, to gain electrons to fill out a valence shell. Another is happy to lose electrons to fill out a valence shell. And so when you connect them, the current flows, but then it, if it can't source any other ions, then it, it stops real quick. But here with just a little water and whatever ions are floating around there, we saw that it established a voltage. But when you loaded it, then suddenly the load was way too much for the process to continue and that process should continue as long as there are ions are available to keep flowing so the next thing would be what well what if we just put this in a glass of tap water or this is actually filtered water will it do any better so now we've just stuck the contraption in a glass of tap water and that's the resting voltage just across the one mega ohm resistor of the meter so you can see that's that's better we're up to 0.77 now let's connect the dummy load. Okay, with the dummy load connected, we're now at 0.37 millivolts. It's actually going back up a little bit. And as odd as it may sound, that's not that bad. Um, we can do better. Just to also show you about uh, it's kind of hard to do because, but if I stir the water with my finger, I oh no, I'm not getting it. But that helps, um, that helps the water circulation. Um, and so brings it up a little. So point, point four, point four milliamps, 400 microamps. So the next thing to do would be, you know, why not feed it some ions? And so one thing you could do would be, well, let's put a little bit of salt in there, sodium chloride. I don't want to do that. And I don't want to do it for a couple of reasons. It would make, it would make for a, a good electrolyte solution. But one, there's a lot of, quote, galvanic corrosion, and it'll dissolve that copper plate real quick. The other thing is that when you have electricity and sodium chloride going around, especially if you decided to try and charge this, you have to worry about chlorine gas. And that's, chlorine gas is very, very bad. So, salt's off the table. You could think about vinegar or lemon juice or some sort of acidic substance. Problem with that is it's also going to dissolve the plate. And there was an interesting article that I'll share with you just in a second here. Um, it was, a, I think, a team out of China that they used a basic electrolyte and they said oh you know what do you know this kind of copper zinc setup can be used as a rechargeable battery because the whole thing with the daniel cell um you know that this the common example of this and all the others they say you can't recharge it but this paper was saying well it looks like you probably can if you use a basic electrolyte so the first electrolyte i'm going to try is baking soda and what's one of the reasons I'm doing this and you see here without without a load now it's climbed up to 0.824 but um, we should be able to do better than that anyways um, baking soda extremely safe extremely cheap so you know a teaspoon of baking soda is what a half cent maybe a penny um, 
And so, you know, what you have is you have copper, zinc, and baking soda. So you might use, like, baking soda to brush your teeth. I went to, to Whole Foods to uh, get a zinc supplement, and I accidentally picked up zinc plus copper. So you, I mean, of course, <laughs> don't, don't do anything with this. But you basically, if anything's coming out into solution, you don't have, like, chlorine gas or whatever. You have a liquid vitamin. You have um, zinc plus copper and some baking soda so uh very safe i'm probably not going to stick with the baking soda so it's probably not going to be that safe but i haven't tried the other one yet but we will this video so first let's just put in some baking soda electrolyte now some of this is just going to be moving the water around it's all clumped together Give me a minute. So I'm not sure if the resting voltage has improved much. I can't remember what it was at. I think it's improved a little bit. Let's see what it does under load. So I just connected it. It's still, no, it's not. It's not. That ain't too shabby. We got 597 microamps so in a moment the battery's starting to get low so i should i should double check that i'll, I'll switch out the battery but um 600 microamps so why am i why am i so excited about that so the number of amps that you can put out is a function of the plate area and you know i've been trying to get about plate spacing but i think the plate spacing isn't that important as long as it there's enough circulation for ions to get in to, to keep flowing. So um, I think the sheets I have are like five inch by five inch or six inch by six inch, but say let's say they're five inch by five inch. So that means it'll be 25 times 0.6. So if you had a cell that was five by five, it would be 25. So 25 times 0.5 would be 12.5. So um, 13 um, whatever um, it's like 14 whatever uh, milliamps and then you know you can put these in series so you could have if you get it to say one volt resting and you have 10 of them then you have 10 volts 14 milliamps um, so you know you'd be putting out a cool 140 milliwatts and the thing is that you know like with the lead acid battery it's just two plates of lead and then when you charge it they become different I, I'm not expert on lead acid battery but it, it's like I think one's lead sulfate and the other one's lead and then as it discharges they equalize and you're left with two plates of the same material without any electronegativity difference so in other words this is a completely discharged battery but as long as there is electrolyte available to it it keeps putting that out so in other words this is the state when the battery is dead and it just keeps putting that out now you could say well it's going to run out of ions in the electrolyte it's like all right dump out the water fill up another glass and put in a penny of uh, baking soda and then you're good to go for however long this lasts and one of the things i'm going to do is put this on that arduino battery capacity meter and get an idea you know, if you have something like this, how long does that go on for? Does it go on for an hour, a, a day, a month? I don't know. And so, you know, there's like a zillion things to do with this. Because the other thing you could do would be to try charging it, which supposedly it can't, that doesn't work with a, a, a zinc copper cell. But you have that paper saying that, well, if you're using a, a basic electrolyte, you can get away with it. And so that would be another thing where you charge it, and then when it runs dead, it just sits there doing that. <laughs> so, um, until again, until the electrolyte is gone. So let's you know, let's not go uh, too hog wild. Let me see if I can how much baking soda I can get in there, and then we're going to do something that I haven't. Well, we'll switch to another material, two other materials first, and then I happen to have some potassium hydroxide. So this is a weak base and potassium hydroxide is a strong base. 
So let's see what we get with potassium hydroxide. But first I'll show you this with a couple other materials. And even before that, I'm going to put in um, stronger, stronger uh, uh, see how strong I can get it with this. So I doubled the amount about in there. I'm not sure if any more can fit in there. So that's what it's sitting at resting. And then let's load it. Let's see what happens. I don't know what's going on. So, I mean, I think I had, when I added more material in, I think the, the electrodes were in the water, and I was thinking maybe it's shorting across the water there. So I dumped out a little bit of the water, and now it stinks. So we had 0.6, I saw it, but now it's down to it's down to that. And, um, but, I mean, I think we can reasonably help for 0.5 with the baking soda per square inch. So... Another thing would be, what if you used, instead of zinc, used aluminum? So here I have some aluminum foil that I folded over, so it's like a gum wrapper now. And aluminum on the electronegativity chart is more electronegative than magnesium, so there's a bigger difference there. And so you would expect it to work better. Um, but then I found another article, and I'll try and do a you know 30 seconds on that, where it's basically saying someone's saying, well, you know, like many times, it turns out it's really complicated that it's not solely electronegativity. I think it's the electronegativity that drives it, but that there are other things that come into play. So uh, I don't want to go too far with that because it could also be that the others are plates, and this is a rolled up foil, but it, as you'll see, it's no good. So here it is just resting in the in the baking soda solution, unloaded, and that's the voltage. And now let's load it. And... Kerfluey. It's just dropping like a rock. So... I don't know why aluminum doesn't work real well. It could be because it's a sheet or it's probably, you know, I mean, when they did this the first time, I I would guess they, I don't know if they had aluminum, but they used copper and zinc. So what's good enough for Volta is good enough for me. Now it's all over the map. Still, I, the other thing, I don't, aluminum is um, is also more toxic and so if it starts coming out into solution or something like that, I mean, it's not like chlorine gas or something, but um, so I don't know what it's doing, but I, I don't like it. And so I'm not going to use aluminum. Let's go back to the other one. Well, actually, we're not going to go back to the exact other one. I happen to have a little bit of silver sheet around because I like to homebrew colloidal silver. And silver is more electronegative than copper. And so silver... Magnesium should work better, but we thought the other one would work better. So what happens here? Okay. Well, every other time I did this with the silver magnesium, it worked better. And now, now it doesn't even look quite as good. And I can't tell you why. I can't tell you why. I'll probably get a copyright infringement. <laughs> uh, let's try it loaded. Yeah, loaded, it's it's looking good. Still haven't done better than 0.6. Alright, why don't we just stop there for today, because I don't want this to go too long. But um, in the next, you know, in the next video, I will show with a, a strong basic electrolyte, sodium hydride, that a um, lot better um, amp flow. It's, it's well over a milliamp per, um, per square inch, and I might even be able to do better than that. Um, and then, you know, there's a question of how long will it go on for? So put it, put it on a capacity tester. And, you know, how long does it take for that electrolyte to, um, to all go, you know, to be used up? And I don't know. And then there's the question of, you know, would this work with, you know, 
unlike a lead acid where you got the same plates, with these two dissimilar plates, how well would it work in a basic solution as a rechargeable battery? Uh, there's that. There's, I mean, I was thinking, you know, maybe I'll make it nanotech. But, but I am kind of thinking you could, you could, you could electroplate different materials onto the positive and negative, the, the copper and the zinc, and that would do two things for you. One, it, it would potentially greatly increase the surface area, and you could electroplate things uh, with better, you know, a more dramatic electronegativity difference. So that's further down the line. And, and finally, there's another weird thing that I saw that um, I want to look at it some more to see, like, you know, is this something going on with a meter? Um, is, but I, I think, <laughs> I think I'm seeing some piezoelectricity action going on when I had when I was using balsa wood as a spacer, which would not be entirely out of the question. But um, that that's another thing. So enough. You can see that this could uh, this go on forever and um, for a very long time. And this is enough for the first part, and I'm going to continue with these, and hopefully we'll uh, uh, continue finding interesting things as we go along. So thanks, and, and uh, stay healthy, everyone. Bye-bye.